Good morning, everybody. Kalimath main disruption is 30 years old. A tremendous amount of research has been done over the last 30 years, and I'd like to review some of the things we've learned and what still needs to be done. I'd like to do this in a unique way by comparing what is known about oriental fruit moth mating disruption, which was first registered in 1986, and cutting moth mating disruption, which was first registered in 1991. The efficacy of oriental fruit moth mating disruption is quite robust. Most people would give it a 10 out of 10. Cutting moth mating disruption is more variable, so I'd like to discuss why the difference between the two systems. So first, we really need to understand the physiological and behavioral responses of each insect to their pheromone. So let's start with the physiological responses. You can see the scan here of a cotting moth. You can see the antenna here. And on the antenna are all these hair-like structures called sensilla. And here is one sensilla or sensillum. And you can see this openings here on the side of the sensillum where the pheromone molecule will move into the inside of the sensillum. To look at that in more detail, here's the pheromone, the black dot that moves through this opening in the sensillum down these pore tubules and then into the sensillum lymph where it's met by binding proteins. And these binding proteins attach to the pheromone molecules and then move them to these receptors on the outer dendrite. When the number of pheromone molecules on their receptors gets to a point, it exceeds a threshold and the signal is sent from the outer dendrite down to the inner dendrite to the olfactory receptor neuron and down the axon. And then the axon sends the signal down the antenna into the antennal lobe where further processing occurs. So just to summarize that then, you have the sensilla on the outside of the antenna. Some are specific to pheromones, some are specific to plant volatile. Both send signals down into the antennal lobe. Processing for pheromones is done differently than for the plant volatiles, but there is an integration of the signal and an output to the brain of the insect. Once the brain receives those signals, then it elicits a certain behavior. And with behavioral responses to calling moth pheromone, the insect is perceiving the pheromone, the males are perceiving the pheromone downwind, and they're moving upwind following a concentration gradient till they get to the female. This is quite a remarkable process given that the female shown here is emitting pheromone at five nanograms per hour. It's quite amazing when you think about a drop of water is 0.05 grams, and this is a very small amount of pheromone on an hourly basis, but the males through the canopy the, are able to follow these plumes, find the female, and then mate with her. And you can see that in this lower part of the graph. Here's an electropiezo sprayer, vibrates at very high intensity and sends a pheromone signal and the male is followed up when in pursuit of it. OFM mating disruption has been working very well for the last 35 years. Why is that? What is it about mating disruption for OFM makes it so robust? So I went back and I looked at some old papers. This one from Tom Baker and Wendell Roloffs in 1981, and it's entitled Sex Pheromone Dosage and Blend Specificity of Response by OFM males. And there's just a couple of points that I'd like to bring from this paper. Males exhibited sustained upwind flight only to intermediate concentrations of pheromone. High concentrations of pheromone caused a respite some distance from the source. So Tom Baker and Wendell Roloffs did another experiment in the field and published this, Initiation and Termination of Oriental Fruit Moth Male Response to Pheromone Concentrations in the Field. And simply, they conducted the experiment in this way. They had concentric rings at known distances from the center. And in the center, they had pheromone lures loaded with either 10 micrograms or 1,000 micrograms of pheromone. So they knew the distance from each one of these rings, and then they released male OFM downwind from these sources of pheromone. And they wanted to follow the flight activation and the upwind flight to these different concentrations of pheromone. And what they found is that depending on the lure dose, 10 micrograms and 1,000 micrograms, first of all, Notice that both the OFM males were activating flight, taking flight to both concentrations, low dose and a high dose. But when you were one meter from the source, from the pheromone lures, the OFM males kept on flying. Whereas to the higher dose, 1,000 micrograms, 56% of those males stopped flying. The dose was too high. Just before the source of pheromone, before these lures, 12% at the low dose stopped, 
didn't make it, but 100% of the males stopped flying towards the higher dose. In other words, they found this upper threshold for active space. So what is the active space? The active space is the concentration of pheromone that enables a successful response. So a successful response being the males down here are detecting the pheromone coming from the female, are able to follow a concentration gradient up to the female where they land and mate with that female. That's the active space. There's a lower concentration and an upper concentration that enables that successful response. So if the concentration is above the upper threshold of the active space, then it overwhelms the sensory system. So if now the pheromone is coming from a hand-applied dispenser, massive concentration of pheromone moving downwind, yes, the males might still initiate flight down here and start flying up, but they get arrested. Just like Tom Baker and his colleagues said, they stop flying because because the concentration is too high. So with respect to mating disruption, we call that non-competitive mating disruption. If the concentration is below the upper threshold of the active space, then the sensory system is not overwhelmed. So again, looking at it, flight is initiated and they fly upwind, but the concentration is not greater than the upper threshold. It's less, so they keep on flying towards those dispensers. We refer to this as competitive mating disruption. So just to kind of quickly show a summary of this, here's your OFM, a female calling, and you have hand-applied dispensers releasing high doses of pheromone. The males are flying upwind, but they get above that active threshold of the active space and they stop flying and cannot proceed further. Whereas with cobbling moth, again, the females are calling, you've got hand-applied dispensers releasing pheromone. The males follow up that plume towards either the dispensers, they do not get overwhelmed and we call this competitive attraction. So going back to OFM, this paper was published by Mike Renke and his colleagues at Michigan State University in 2014 called Pheromone Release Rate Determines Whether Sexual Communication of Oriental Fruit Moth is Disrupted Competitively or Non-Competitively. So what they concluded was that OFM is disrupted competitively with female equivalent pheromone dispensers. Like you see here is the lure. So you put 400 of these out, the release rate coming off those lures is more equivalent to a female OFM. So if you have 400 of these per acre, then OFM is disrupted competitively because the males are flying to them. But if you put high releasing dispensers, hand applied dispensers out, then they're disrupted non-competitively with these dispensers. Dispensers. They're getting arrested in flight. They're not able to complete the location. So non-competitive mating disruption, just to summarize, flight is initiated, they fly upwind, and the concentration gets too high because they're coming from a pheromone dispenser, overwhelms their sensory system, and they get arrested. They stop flying. So what does this mean for you as growers? Well, if you were to walk into an orchard, your stone fruit orchard, you really need to think about, okay, it's going to be non-competitive. So what you want is a uniform, even distribution of high release dispensers that last season long. Because if you get a uniform distribution of these high release dispensers, you're going to have a concentration of pheromone that is high enough everywhere in the orchard to disrupt those insects, those OFM males non-competitively. So you you can see that in this graph here. Control is density independent, and I'll show you this in a second. So here you see on the y-axis, you can see percent catch, 100% catch down to zero. And as you put out the number of dispensers here, you can see you get to the point where you have enough dispensers out there that fill the entire orchard with enough pheromone at a high enough concentration so that the upper threshold of the active space is reached and you shut down male flight. Or get arrested. So if you look at this chart, you can see it's a 10, let's say it's a 10 acre orchard. Each one of these red dots represents a pheromone dispenser. The blue dots would represent concentrations or density of OFM insects in that orchard. You can see high populations here and low populations over here. Well, with OFM mating disruption, because it's non-competitive, it's more density independent. So as long as you have a concentration or an application of enough high releasing dispensers, you can get good uniform concentration and shutdown of OFM men. What about cutting moth mating disruption? As I said at the beginning, it's working okay after 30 years, but it's not a 10 out of 10 all the time. Why not? So what's been observed in the field? 
Peter Witzkel in Sweden has done a lot of behavioral work and where he's looking at the response of Kalimoth males in orchards treated with pheromone dispensers. Remember, these dispensers have release rates about a thousand times greater than what a Kalimoth female releases. So over a two or three year period, Peter and his colleagues actually sat out in orchards watching the behavior of Kalimoth male and female insects in response to the treatment with pheromone dispensers. And they became so good at this that they were able to differentiate male and female cotling moth from each other. He concluded that cotling moth mating disruption treatment turns on cotling moth's search engine, causes them to fly and search for sources. Gary Judd and his colleagues at Summerland, British Columbia, published this paper in 2005 called The Behavioral Response and Attraction of Cotling Moth Males to Their Pheromone Following Various Pre-Exposures. So what Gary wanted to find out is if you treated an orchard with pheromone dispensers and placed cotling moth in there, they would have a certain exposure to whatever background concentration was created in the orchard. And they wanted to see how that impacted their behavior in wind tunnels in laboratory situations. So what Gary did is he took, first of all, applied pheromone dispensers to these orchards, and then he took calling moth males and he put them into bags and hung those bags into the trees. So whatever concentration was created by these pheromone dispensers is what the exposure was to these males in the bags. And he did this and left them there for 24 hours and then took the bags and then took them back to the lab and wanted to see whether or not after this exposure, whether males would actually fly up to a pheromone source, a lure or a female. And sure enough, those Kalimas still flew to that source. So Gary then wanted to know what would it take, what kind of exposure would it take to calling moth pheromone in order to shut it down. So he took calling moth males and put them in these mason jars with known concentrations of pheromone and sealed and left them there. And he determined that it would take 30 minutes of exposure to concentrations of about 35 micrograms of cotamone per liter of air in order to eliminate their upwind flight to a pheromone source or to affect the sensilla on the antenna so that the sensilla would no longer send signals down to the brain of the insect. A lot of pheromone over a, quite a period of time before cuddling moth would be shut down. So in light of Gary's results from the previous slide, let's look at some release rate comparisons. So on this slide, we've got a logarithmic scale going from 10 up to 100 million nanograms. And so this is the pheromone emission rates. So we start with the female that releases 5 nanograms per hour, so way at the bottom of the scale. And like I said, a hand-applied dispenser is releasing roughly 1,000 times more, so 5,510 nanograms per hour. And then Gary's mason jar, where he determined there was 35,000 nanograms per hour, that it would take in order to shut down Kali Moth responses to pheromone. And then up here, 32 million nanograms per hour that come out of a pheromone emitter. So that gives you a, a relative comparison. So with those release rate uh, comparisons in mind, let's look at another couple of experiments conducted by Peter McGee for his PhD at Michigan State University. He wanted to look at how high exposure increased flight and trap catch. I'll show you two slides, one with aerosols and one with hand-applied dispensers. So with aerosols, you had three treatments. You had four 10-acre blocks treated with nothing, no pheromone, four 10-acre blocks treated with aerosol emitters at one per acre. These blocks here were also treated with emitters at one per acre. What he did is he took bags and he put 800 calling moths onto branches and covered them up with bags in each one of these treatments. The only difference is on this treatment here, the blue bar, you can see he sprayed with aerosol five times onto the leaves before he put the cuddling moth and the bags over the branch. So this was treated with a lot of pheromone. This was just the background concentration of pheromone from the one meter per acre and no pheromone. He then took those bags off the branches and took those cuddling moth to an untreated orchard. So no pheromone exposure at all and released them and wanted to see what those exposures did to flight and trap catch. And lo and behold, what you see is that those blocks where they had treated with five sprays directly onto the foliage, they became super searchers. Those flew the most and got the most trap captures in these other orchards. 
He also did the same thing with hand applied dispensers. So the same basic protocol. So we had four 10 acre blocks, each treated with hand applied dispensers in this gray bar and in the yellow bar. And then the yellow bar is four 10 acre blocks untreated. And again, he put bags over with 800 uh, cotton moth in each of these treatments in the no pheromone and in the 400 per acre. And in this one, the only thing he did differently is he put two hand applied dispensers inside those bags. So lots of exposure coming from those. He took all of the bags out and then released the colleague moth into untreated orchards to see what the pheromone exposure would do to flight and trap capture. And you can see once again that the exposure to higher concentrations of pheromones stimulated flight and searching behavior and trap captures. So this, again, is an example of competitive attraction. Exposure to high concentrations of pheromone, whether it be hand applied or aerosol sprays, stimulated that flight and searching behavior. They become super searchers and move up towards sources of pheromone. So what does this mean for you? First of all, dispensers compete with males, okay? And so because of that competition between dispensers and males for the attention of the females, then you need to know where all your hotspots are. Therefore, pheromone trapping is incredibly important to you. By knowing where your hotspots are or where your low population sites are, then you can adjust dispenser density and supplemental control. Kali moth mating disruption is competitive. Therefore, control is density dependent. You can see on this graph here from Larry Gute and Peter and Jim Miller, you've got trap suppression here on the y-axis and the number of dispensers on the x-axis. So uh, if you have zero dispensers, you get this catch up here, close to 100% catch. And as you add even a few dispensers, you can see even with minimum amount, maybe five or 10 dispensers in these plots, you reduce trap catch by about 75%. And as you add more dispensers, you improve the efficacy of mating disruption, of trap suppression. So it operates by competitive attraction. But as you get into higher populations, you can see many more females out there, same number of dispensers, and all of a sudden the competition goes up. So what that means is Kali moth mating disruption is competitive attraction density dependent. So on this graphic here from Vince Jones and Mike Dore, the red dots represent pheromone dispensers and the blue dots represent populations of Kali moth. Larger blue dots represent higher populations. Small blue dots represent small populations. And you can see over here where this arrow is, you've got like 20 Kali moth that were found in this location. And you've got really the same number of dispensers out here as you do over here on the right hand side where you've only found one Kali moth. So you got one Kali moth, low population pressure, and you've got the same number of dispensers. So you've got to remember that dispenser density relative to Kali moth population is really important. The more traps, the better. You need to know where your hot spots are, where your low populations are. You need to trap with as many traps as you can manage. Point sources are extremely important. Regardless of what formulation you're using, two to 400 dispensers to the acre is really important for control of Kali moth. Why not increase the release rate and reduce the number of point sources? Larry Goot did this experiment about 20 years ago, not long after BioControl came out with a dispenser called Isomate CTT. And we had thought that labor was being an issue. Therefore, why not put twice as much pheromone in a dispenser, but reduce the number of point sources that you have to place per acre? So Larry compared the 200 of the Isomate CTT with 200 Isomate C plus and 400 Isomate C plus relative to a no pheromone control. And so here's the release rates. So the blue bars represent the release rate coming off an Isomate CTT applied at 200 dispensers. The gray bars represent the amount of pheromone coming off the Isomate C plus dispenser applied at 400 to the acre. You can see CTT has a higher release rate. Therefore, the logic being then you could put out less point sources per acre. What did Larry find? Well, he did fruit injury at harvest. The full rate of C plus was the best of all of those pheromone treatments. So here's 400 C plus and 200 of the CTT. And you can see that 200 C plus worked almost as well or a little bit better than 200 CTT. What that means is that increasing the release rate from a dispenser, putting more pheromone in there, does not compensate for putting out less point sources per acre. 
Let's look at another experiment conducted by Larry Goot at Michigan State University, looking at the application rate, number of point sources, versus population size. So in a high population situation, Gary went back and looked at CTT at 50 per acre, CTT at 100 per acre, CTT at 200 per acre. And again, like we showed in those previous slides, a 400 C plus with the extra point sources is better. But what happens when you get into areas of your orchard or in your entire orchard where your population density is low? And that's been determined by using extensive use of pheromone traps and history of that block. So what about the dispenser density relative to a lower cuddling moth population density? And Larry showed this, that under low populations, all of a sudden the discrepancy between the different application rates of the different dispensers gets minimized. In other words, if 200 CTT per acre is not that different from 400 C plus per acre at a low population density. And as you saw from Larry's previous experiment, 200 of C plus would work as well as 200 CTT, but at half the price of 400 dispensers to the acre. And as a result, Biocontrol registered CM Flex, which goes out 200 to 400 dispensers per acre because of this data. So the take-home messages from this part of my talk, OFM mating disruption works by non-competitive attraction. Calling moth mating disruption works by competitive attraction. The efficacy of mating disruption is density dependent. Calling moth has this aggregative distribution. We know them as hotspots. So monitoring populations with pheromone traps and visual inspections of orchard is most critical, the most critical thing you can do. And the application of point source is of critical importance with the idea relative to the population density in your orchard. For the last part of my talk, I'd like to talk about aerosol formulations. Currently, there are four formulations available to you in Washington State. The Puffer CM, the CM Mist, Smart Release CM, and the Semio system. What does the distribution of pheromone from an aerosol look like relative to what the distribution from a hand-applied dispenser would look like? First of all, these are Excel files used by Rufus Isaac at MSU to illustrate what 400 dispensers to acre might look like. So each one of these points represents the placement of a dispenser, and you can see the even kind of distribution of pheromone release coming from those dispensers. With an aerosol, though, you only go one or two per acre, but it's a vast amount more pheromone being released from each aerosol emission than from hand applied. And that's represented by the much larger peaks, but only two per acre. So how does pheromone then get released from an aerosol and cover such an area? Well, what happens with an aerosol is that you take your pheromone and you mix it with some sort of solvent to keep it in solution and you place it into the can. And then the gas the propellant is injected into the can. And these propellant gases have a very, very low boiling point. So some of them are, have like minus 15 degrees Fahrenheit boiling point. So they're all put into the can. And so every time the emission is released, you get this blast of propellant and pheromone and solvent into the air. And it's like an explosion and it breaks up the pheromone particles and the solvents into very, very small particles, 30 to uh, 120 microns in size. And these small particles, just like spray drift, can move a long ways. This is a chart from Stephen Welter at the University of California. He talks about the movement of pheromones from aerosols. And so what he did is he put an aerosol unit here, and the unit was turned off, and then he had traps downwind, and he was measuring the percent trap suppression. And you can see he's only 5% suppression, 25% uh, suppression. The traps are all catching downwind. And then he turns the unit on here. And with the wind behind, now all of a sudden with the pheromone being released from this emitter, you're getting 90, 95%, 75% trap suppression, quite a bit more than what you saw on when the unit was turned off. So that pheromone is moving both longitudinally and laterally a great distance from the source of emission. What about the mode of action of aerosols, and how does that compare with the mode of action of hand-applied dispensers? Peter McGee did his PhD at Michigan State under Larry Goot, looking at how males respond to the pheromone coming from aerosols. And he determined that males move upwind towards an emitter. So here's the large plume coming from the emitter, and males are falling up along the edges of these plumes and then accumulating in behind the emitters, leaving females only downwind. 
So without the males, no mating. Again, he determined to be mode of action being displacement, males being displaced from this area, therefore no mating occurs. So competitive attraction or competitive mating disruption is very similar with aerosols and hand applied. The concentration of pheromone is insufficient to impact their sensory system, so the flight is not arrested. So the males move up towards an aerosol emitter and they're accumulating in behind, leaving females downwind of the emitters with no males in the area, therefore no mating. So the high emissions from these aerosol emitters do not overwhelm the sensory system. They still can fly. Because of that, then point sources are important too with competitive attraction. Here is more data from Peter's PhD work. And so we've got, in terms of percent trap shutdown, here you've got zero emitters, so you've got zero percent trap shutdown. One emitter every four acres gives you pretty close to 50% trap shutdown. One every two acres, 77%. One per acre, two per acre, three per acre, four per acre. You can see you get the same sort of curve as you add more and more emitters. And it's not unlike that same curve that I showed you for hand applied is just shown inversely. Point sources are important too because competitive attraction is how aerosols are working. And Peter determined that to get the same efficacy of 400 dispensers per acre, you would need about two emitters per acre. This was done in 10 acre blocks, mind you. So keep that in mind. When you work in 100 acre or 1,000 acre blocks, emitters will work better. But in his experiment, 10 acre blocks, it took about two units per acre to equal 400 dispensers of hand applied. So there's just one more experiment that came out of Peter McGee's PhD thesis research, and that is dealing with the number of emissions from aerosol emitters. And Peter looked at both the trap captures of sterile insects and wild insects relative to the number of emissions per hour coming from emitters. And you can see here whether he sprayed once an hour twice an hour or four times an hour, there was really no statistical difference in terms of shutting down the trap captures, both with sterles and with wilds. But as soon as you turned off the emitters, then catches went up accordingly. So it's really important to have those aerosol emitters emitting pheromone all the time. Turning them off can result in problems. So you can say, well, we're between flights or I'm not catching anything in my traps, but your traps, the resolution is not to the point where you can be absolutely confident there's no colleague moth activity out there. So having aerosol emissions occurring throughout the flight period of colleague moth is really important. Beware the windward border with aerosol emitters. Again, you're putting them out along the borders and there's large gaps. Insects tend to move towards the edges anyway. So if you have gaps, then you can have areas where the female is calling and the males are mating with them. So border sprays or hand applied dispensers along the edges are really important. So which dispensing system is better? I think that both can work and both can fail. It's all about how you manage the system relative to the kinds of populations and densities that you have. So hand applied, I think, is probably more robust because you've got a uniform distribution of dispensers that just release from the time they're put out and until they're empty. So you want dispensers that go at least 180, 200 days of emission to get your full season protection. Aerosols can work fine too, but again, you do have the issue of more gaps along the borders and always treating larger areas is incredible be important to the efficacy of aerosols. So the take-home message from this part of my talk is aerosols release particles 30 to 120 microns in size. Therefore, pheromone coverage is extensive. They move a long ways. Aerosols work by competitive traction, just like hand-applied dispensers do. Therefore, point sources are important too. Border areas can have gaps due to separation. I'd like to end by just going back to what I was talking about at the beginning. Why are the responses to pheromone between OFM and Kali Moss so different? OFM, high concentrations of rest flights, 100 to 200 dispensers to the acre is what you need. As long as you have a uniform concentration from those dispensers, you can arrest flight and get good control. Whereas high concentrations of pheromone from dispensing devices stimulates flight. So Kali Moth continued to fly and looking for sources of pheromone. Unfortunately, we're still missing the link between the basic and applied research. We need to understand this question and the differences. But unfortunately, we've lost so many researchers over the last 10 years or so, it's hard to get this work done. As a result of that, 
we have to fall back on what we know works, the success of a systems approach. So I look at the mating disruption being the foundation, the brick wall in which the system is built on. And by knowing the modes of action, which I discussed today, population density and point sources and how one relates to the other, then you can put together a systems approach, which is sanitation, banding, roguing off infested fruit, use of insecticides, proper timing to reduce the populations, and then now sterile release is becoming important. But really central to it all is the use of traps. Having enough traps out there so that you know where your hotspots are, you know where your low populations are, therefore you can adjust your management approach according to what you find in your orchard. In finishing, I'd like to dedicate this presentation to the memory of Larry Goot. Larry passed away in September of 2021. He began his career in Washington State with Jay Bruner in 1991, and he dedicated the next 30 years to understanding behavior, modes of action of both both OFM and Kalimoth. He made so substantial contributions to our knowledge and really helped us implement these important technologies. Larry, you will be missed. And with that, thanks for listening.